Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All coming on. Okay, I'm Simon Helmer. I'm the Energy Advisor at the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thanks for joining us in our new COVID resistant format. Um, and if anyone's wondering behind me, yeah, the background is, is a shed. That's where I am. Um, basically, we've had an issue with a, a second license we bought for Zoom, which would give us our normal kind of almost unlimited meeting time. For some reason, it's not worked. So we're going to have to limit it to 40 minutes. If we overrun into an beyond that, we'll send out a new link to a new meeting. We'll carry it on. Uh, so, yeah, if I can just share my screen and introduce the agenda can everybody see that powerpoint so basically we've got um richard butler is going to speak about water management and a few related issues uh, so it'll be about 20 minutes and uh basically david cole will speak about um, pollution containment if you have any um questions then please um flag them up using the chat function uh, so basically just click on a chat function and, and post your, your question and the speakers will either pick it up there and then or leave it to sort of the end of the presentation. So if I can now hand over to Richard um, to do his slot about water management. Thanks. Okay, good morning everybody. Morning. Um, yeah, I think well, I've got 20 minutes so I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I've got a PowerPoint, um, hopefully it's not death by PowerPoint um, and hopefully there's some interesting points on there. So. If I can share my screen and, and just just crack on, if I may. Um, da, 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 where's the PowerPoint? There we go. Okay, so um, I've got thin slides here, guys. So um, I guess I'll be as quick as I can. Um, so Richard Butler, um, I run two companies. We've got um, water audit surveys, um, which has been going for over twenty years. That's a water consultancy firm, um, and I'll go into a bit more detail what, what that involves. Um, and I've also got a company called um, H2IQ, um, which deals with um, water efficiency. So I think that that's the key for today, um, how, we, how we save um, money on water and reduce consumption and, and charges. So if we go straight on to the, the content. So what I'd like to discuss today... Um, is um, water shortage, which I think we're all um, acutely aware of with the hot weather we've had. Um, I want to do a little piece on water quality and the importance of um, Legionella control and everybody getting back to work, going back into offices that have been closed for a, for a number of weeks. Um, how do we reduce consumption? Um, a few case studies, um, a little bit about H2OIQ and what we're doing there, developing new products, um, which could be interesting to you guys. And then I some extra points here are just like if I've got time I'll go through those which is all kind of linked with the sustainability that we're, we're all involved in um, and that's um, water cleaning, um, air purification and a uh, catalyst that goes into HVAC systems which is really interesting that we're getting into so this, this part of the business here H2IQ it's going to morph into more of a, a building services company so there's more than just water um, that we're involved in and helping out a number of customers and this is a uh, very much customer led. We've got a council and a couple of universities interested in these three additional areas. Um, so we're pursuing those. Um, so yeah, we'll just kick off. Um, probably covered a lot of this already. Um, Water Consultancy, um, part of this H2IQ group. Um, we're based in Worcestershire, but cover the whole of the country. Um, and our main remit on the consultancy side is looking at, at water cost reduction. That's the big, big driver for our clients. They, that's 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 what they want. They come to us. How can we reduce our water bills? Simple as that. Um, and also um, linked with that, obviously, is the uh, is the, the importance of water quality. Um, water efficiency through H two I Q. Um, main, mainly, that's surveying buildings. Um, getting into a building. Um, again, customer led. They, they contact us and say um, we've, we've got high consumption. Could you come in and, and do an audit for us and find out why? So, um, yeah, that's the part of the job that I love. I tend to be out and about a lot and um, I get on site. It could be as simple as a, as a water leak. So that's, um, that's investigating the, um, the water meter. Um, hopefully I can do a simple process of turning off internal stop taps, 
um, and that's what I advise you guys to do. I think you should do that periodically and just make sure that your external water um, stops dead. Um, and also, um, if, if it's not an external water leak with high consumption, it's, um, it, it's potentially internally inefficient too. Um, so that's where we get involved in manufacturing our own products and also sourcing the, the, the best products out there for our clients. And I'll, I'll do this. Um, we're also developing um, a, a smart meter um, with an app. Um, so um, this is um, very much do, um, driven by the domestic market. Um, Affinity Water, Thames Water, and Southern Trend Water are interested in this. But it has got commercial opportunities. Um, put it on, on your riser community building, and, um, and you can, you can um, analyze the, uh, the consumption going through that with, with real time data. Okay, so we'll crack on. Um, water shortage, um, a precious resource. Um, I think we've all heard this week that there's been a 20% increase in water usage. Um, so um, I, I've certainly suffered at home here. We've had a, a, a drop in water pressure. And, and this is what we're all concerned about because potentially this is what we're going to face in the future. Um, climate change and population growth a, a real struggle for uh, the water companies to provide sufficient um, water volumes. Um, so there's been lots of talk about the southeast being the worst affected area, um, where they're looking to go potentially water negative beyond 2025. Do our bit to, to conserve water, and I'll, I'll take you through that in a bit and uh, how we're going to achieve that. Um, there's a couple of quotes there that, that, um, that I, I quite like, that kind of um, put, puts, puts all this into perspective, really. Um, so if you want to read through those we've got there. I uh, think the important one there for me is, is James Bevin's speech. Um, when he did the, um, from, he's the CEO of Environmental Agency. And he did, um, he did a speech uh, last year on, this, on called Escaping the Jaws of Death, um, which is um, population growth, and, uh, and climate change, and uh, he, he predicted that uh, parts of the UK will be water negative by 2025. Okay, so the, the benefits of, of doing what we can to be water efficient, um, it, it can help more than just cost. Um, it can help the business comply with current and future environmental legislation. Um, not everybody thinks of, of water having a carbon footprint, but it does. Um, the water has to be pumped by the by the water company. Um, obviously, when you when you're heating your hot water, that's that's got a, an energy impact to it. Um, but um, yeah, if if you can save a, a, sorry a thousand liters a year, um, you're looking at just over one kilogram of, of, of carbon reduction. So, where we go into a, into a company and, and we're saving you know, ten hundred thousand liters a year a month. Um, it, it does have a big, big impact on, on the carbon footprint. Um, uh, I think I'll just skip those if that's okay, guys, because we've got to rush through this. Um, water quality. Um, we all know about Legionella. This is really dear to my heart. Um, lost a good friend to... Um, I, I do like to have this as a, as a subject that I, I discuss a lot. Uh, moved to France and... Um, they thought he got flu, the pneumonia, and it worked out to be, uh, to be Legionella. So it's really important that we, we control um, the growth of, of this bacteria. Um, so if we're all going back to work, we need to make sure that we've got our, our flushing regimes sorted. Um, so um, it, uh, the growth period uh, is in the range of, of 20 to 50 degrees. Um, Anything less than 20 degrees, the bacteria can't grow. Hot water should be stored at over 60 degrees C, um, and then rapid growth in the right conditions, especially in stagnant water. So that's the problem we've had with the lockdown. So when we all go back to work, we need to um, open each water outlet for at least five minutes. And then going forward, I think we need to really concentrate on doing a weekly flush for all outlets that, that aren't used. Um, and then we've got other aspects here um, where we do a, a quarterly descale and sanitize uh, of shower heads and, and tap spray nozzles, annual water tank cleans, um, and then 
thermal gain is also important for external pipes and, and water storage. Um, really important is dead legs, the amount of surveys that where there's um, significant amount of dead legs and that is where you've got um, what used to be a T off a supply. It's now being cut off for, for whatever reason and um, these dead legs need to be removed straight back to, to, the, to that T. Um, so how do we reduce consumption? Um, on the water consultancy side, the uh, best place to start is to look at historical billing. Um, we, we've got, lots of our customers have got um, bills that come in, they've, they've been overcharged, they've been recredited, re and I think it's wor a worthwhile exercise just to just to audit that, those bills and, and make sure that um, all the tariffs are correct and that there hasn't been any error. Um, we also advise on regular meter reads, um, depending on the contract that you've got with your, with your water supplier, your water retailer, um, that they can, they're allowed by law to, to read the meter as, as um, a, a, only two years, but we, we'd like to sign our contracts to make sure the meter is read every six months. But for, for customers with large usage, I think it's really worth um, putting your own spreadsheet together, doing your own monthly meter read. We say on the first of each month, let's go and read the water meter, compare that to last month's read. Really simple exercise, and it just makes sure that if you've got any increase in consumption, um, you know about it sooner rather than later. Um, got a client, Euro Garages, trying to get them to have AMR, um, automatic meter reading on their revenue meters. Um, that way we can, we can see a, a spike in usage straight away. The amount of sites I've been to where I have a phone call, Rich, we've had a massive uh, water bill through um, and that, that leak could have been going on for 18 months and um, a small water leak can soon mount up to £60,000 because these water companies just, they're, they're just not reading the, the meters quick enough and um, that means that when, when they do read the meter there's a big catch up, huge bill, so I would really recommend regular water reads. Um, external leaks, um, like I say, if you turn your internal stop tap off, reread your meter, if it's an external meter that is, and just double check you haven't got any ex external leak. Um, internal leaks, uh, where it's a, a kind of domestic type usage, washrooms are a big problem. Um, there's, there's lots of inefficient equipment out there, and I'll strongly recommend you have a look at um, a few products um, which can quickly reduce your water consumption. So I've got, I've got a couple here. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have got, have got showers at work, but if you have, um, really simple um, ex exchange of a shower head um, with a restrictor, taking it down to seven and a half litres a minute. You don't need to shower in any more than seven and a half litres a minute with a correct shower head. Um, so that's, they've got, they've got the fine, fine holes for distributing the water. Um, most showers that we go and inspect when we're auditing are around about 12 to 13 litres a minute. Doesn't sound a lot, a lot, but 12 to 13 and a half litres a minute um, can significantly uh, increase your water usage. Um, tap restrictors. Um, again, these should be cleaned every quarter. Most taps now have got some sort of spray nozzle, aerator, restrictor on the end of it. Um, again, um, if, it, if it's just a spray nozzle, just to give you a, an even pattern coming out of the tap, I see lots running at, at, at 20 litres a minute. Um, yeah, if we just go back to this one here, sorry guys. Good example here. Um, this tap here was running at 18 litres a minute. So if we, if, we, if we say in an office environment that's running for 30 minutes a day, that will use 140,000 litres a year. At seven Trent water rates, 367 pounds a year. We can put a restrictor on the end of there, um, reducing that down to 1.9 litres a minute. Um, that's the new annual cost and you're saving £329 a year, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer for me. Um, restrict your, your tap flows, you, you've got enough adequate water coming through at 1.9 litres a minute. We did a hotel group, um, Celtic Manor down in Newport, Cardiff. Um, we put these tap restrictors on their uh, common area taps and we got a 72% reduction in water consumption. So uh, it's, it's well worth doing. Um, back to this one. Um, this is an interesting product, this one. Um, a WC delayed inlet valve. 
So I highly recommend these. Um, if you've got your traditional ball valve, um, you, when you flush the toilet, you've got, you've got your six litre system, you'll empty, empty that six litres, that's fine. But what you've got is your ball valve as it drops, the valve opens, not only have you got your six litres going through, you've probably got another two to three litres going through to the bowl, which is completely not needed. So this is a delayed fill valve and that will not inlet the water until the siphon process is finished. So you guarantee a six litre flush. So again, we, we installed these at Coventry University and we took the toilet flush from 9.6 down to 6.2 litres a minute. Um, so I think it worked out 32, 33% saving. So they were delighted with that because they thought we couldn't find any savings. Um, okay, where are we guys? Um, so yeah, um, Again, the siphons, you can get efficient siphons. Urinals as well, I'm not sure if you've got urinals at work. I, th I think most people know that they, they eat a lot of water, uh, drink a lot of water, I should say. And um, there's ways to manage that by, by putting a, a control device in um, that will make it flush four to eight times a day, depending on, on, on amount of usage. And there's products that can be put into the urinal bowl to stop the, 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 the smell. So, um, yeah. Um, and, and, and um, improve the, the bacteria content that we will produce, horrible thoughts. Um, surface water drainage is another one, guys. Um, another example here, um, this is a, a project we had for CSM Bakery. Um, huge site, the old stalk margarine factory. I uh, probably can't see that very clearly, but what we've got here is two outlets of surface water here. That actually went into the River Mersey, and we got them close to half a million pounds back. Um, surface water drainage is charged by how big an area you occupy. Um, so this is a huge site, so we've got a really good saving for them. So this is what we call a non-connection, but it's also worth just checking your boundaries of your site, checking with your water company, how they charge for surface water drainage. Quite often they get them into the wrong, wrong boundaries. Um, and then moving on um, quickly, so I'm running out of time here. Um, we've got new suppliers, which, which should never be, never be seen as an exercise for, um, saving vast amounts of money because there's not a lot of margin for the water retailers, but it's certainly worth it for um, better customer service. Um, in Seven Trent Water, uh, we de defaulted to Water Plus, as we all know. And I think they, they, they're quite famous now for not being the best at, um, at, at customer service. We've got a really good, um, really good working relationship with Business Stream and Wave where we put a lot of our customers and, and they, they really enjoy um, a, a better customer experience, a, a decent account manager to sort out any issues. Um, and we, we hand hold, hold our clients through that process. Um, alternative water supply, um, we could have a look at rainwater harvesting, uh, boreholes for, for processed water. Um, been, been in the business for 20 years, so plenty of contacts, plenty of projects. Um, trade effluent, I'm not sure if any of you guys have got any, any processed water, any non-domestic waste, it's worth looking at trade effluent as an, op as an option, um, um, which is actually is a legal requirement, but um, again, going back to Celtic Manor that I've done recently, we, we move them over to trade effluent for their swimming pools and, and we save them a fortune. So, um, okay, lots, lots others to discuss here, but um, Simon, I think I'm out of time, aren't I? Yeah. yeah, apologies for that. We had to sort of rush through uh, fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, do you want to flash up your um, contact details quickly, Rich, as if anyone wants to get in touch with you on a yeah, specific sure, yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, where are we? You got them on the last slide. A few, a few case studies. Um, just very quickly, I did want to talk to you about these areas. They're really important. Um, cleaning with ozone water is, is the new thing. It really is. Um, Fantastic. You don't need any chemicals other than degreasants and lime scale remover. These are going into councils, they're going into hotel groups, travel lodge have just taken it on, village have had it for a couple of years. Um, and it's 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 just all, all been a, a bit more environmentally aware. Um, no chemicals, just um, cleaning with ozone water that kills 99.99% of bacteria. Air purification. Um, catalyst that goes into heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. And there we go, contact details. 
So um, if, if you'd need, any of you guys want to have a, have a chat about anything that we've discussed, we've got any requirements or need any help with anything, I'd, I'd love to help you out. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, okay. Yeah, so basically I'm going to hand it to David Cole. If he does get cut off, and um, basically we'll immediately send out another meeting for you to, to re-log back on. Um, but yeah, if I can hand over to David now to talk about pollution containment. Sorry to interject. Um, Rich, can you, um, were you all right to stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Yeah, if you stop sharing your screen. Um, okay, sorry, yeah, yeah. That's okay. okay. Yeah. That's no all problem. right. No problem. And I think um, if David's got some slides to share, um, you'll need to um, stop yourself as the host as well. So if you hover over your name, um, yeah. you can see that you'll have host next to you. Next to your name in brackets. Sorry, I'm just I'm just trying to get this sorted. Um, That's all right. All I've got is uh, is mute for me, unfortunately. Um, if you hover over your uh, main screen, there's some banners at the bottom. One should say yes. "Manage Participants." Can you see that one with the little people as icons? Yes. If you click on that one, yeah. On the right hand side, you'll get a list of everyone here. Yes. Can you see that it says Richard Butler host? It does. Yes. If you click on um, HW Chamber, which is me. Click yes, on more yes. and put make me the host. Okay, yes. Okay, and then I can swap over. Um, right, so what I'm going to do now then. Thank you. That's all right. So I'm going to hand over then to David. David, I'm going to make you the host so that you can share your screen. Is that okay? That's fine. That's fine. Okay, this is okay. very complicated. <laughs> it can be complicated, can't it? Right, I'll do that now. Then I'll make you the host, okay. David, so you can share your screen. Right, -o. okay, there you go. Hang on a minute. I think I am. Have you got my screen now? No, I haven't and I can see some shaking heads. No, hang on. You've just got David Cole on yeah. the screen. Hang on. Oh. Do you have to sh hit, hit the, 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 the share screen? There we go. Yeah. It's just it's just me starting. It's it's like it's like there's a slight delay when you're using Zoom. <laughs> so I'll just try I'll just try hopefully it's going into the presentation mode right now. I'm gonna try and be so have you got my screen? Can you see yes. my screen now? It should yeah. be blank at the moment. Hopefully it's coming up with a I've still got the little um the wheel of death at the moment um wandering around. Can you I don't know if you can see the actual screen? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, right. see it. I think we've got it. Okay. So, right, I'm going to try and do this nice and quick because I know that the guys are really pressed for time. Uh, if there's anything that comes out of it, we are a locally based staple on Seven Business. Get in touch with Simon or get in touch with me direct, our company direct. This is something that we offer. We do a lot of webinars. They're free of charge. If there's information you want, please get in touch. This is really important. Water pollution is in, in a dire mess. We have plastic pollution. We have oil pollution. We really need businesses to get on board. Right, okay, so Sandfield Penstock Solutions, Pollution Prevention, and I'm going to introduce you to a guidance called Syria 736. I'm not sure if any of the people today are aware of that guidance. If you're not, you should be, and you should have read it by now. It is actually a free guidance, so I'm going to fire into this and try and be as quick as I can, guys. So a little bit about my background, okay? I'm a maintenance craftsman. I used to work for Ford Motor Company in Leamington Spa. Sadly, it's closed now, like a lot of manufacturing companies have. Uh, I invented a product called Envirovalve, which is an inflatable bladder for drains in 1998. I actually invented it for Ford Motor Company. Uh, uh, it worked. I challenged the Environment Agency about how we dealt with pollution. So the, the current way of pollution, I hate to sort of criticise some of the environment industry, is about reacting to pollution. In other words, we clean it up after we've done the damage. I invented a product that stopped it in the drain and I sucked it out and recycled it. Had a lot of challenges from the environmental industry, including the Environment Agency, because that's not how you do things. Everything we do is about pollution incident. We go in there with tankers, we go in there with products that we all buy, and we move the pollution somewhere else. I believe that this technology we introduced stopped that, because if there's no pollution, there's no impact on the environment. Okay, so I invented a product called Drain Block, which is now used by the Fire Brigade, which is where my involvement with the EA. So the EA su supply that product to the Fire Brigade. So if you are unfortunate to have, a, say, a factory fire, 
um, what you'll you'll find is is that product would be used by the fire brigade if they were called out to block the drains if you hadn't got a, a piece of equipment. I've won some awards. I was involved in the writing of Sirius 736, which I'm going to talk about. I've worked for ADI Water Pollution, which is ADI is a £100 million company based in Birmingham. I work for Hydro International, and I'm now with Sam, Samfield Penstock Solutions, which is part of Samfield Engineering Group. If anybody's in the motor industry trade, they might be aware of Samfield Engineering and its 60-year history in making um, jigs and fixture clamping equipment for the car industry. So these are some of our customers. You'll see there we've got Jaguar, which is actually the new, the new battery plant they've built in Coventry. Batteries, everybody's talking about batteries nowadays. Remember, batteries, uh, if you have a fat fire, lithium batteries produce a pollutant, which will change the sex of aquatic life. It's a really dangerous product, and we can't contain it. So this is a, a real serious area that these companies are picking up, is that if you have a pollution incident, remember it's a crime. Even if you have a fire, you commit a crime if you pollute the environment. So it's not a case if you just go to an insurance company and you're covered, because as soon as it's left your site and it's now no longer a third-party problem, it's a um, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a world, worldwide problem, it's the country problem, you will get prosecuted or you may get prosecuted by the regulator. So a little bit, I'm trying to rush this through, so, uh, you know, appreciate um, about the time scale. So normally I spend a bit more time. Chronology. David. Sorry, seven, three. Yes, sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I've just had a random pop-up message from Zoom. I've never seen this before. It said Zoom has given me a present and it has removed the 40 minute time limit from our meeting. All oh, right. So, um, okay. I, I, it might be a sort of like a. Um, it might be like a, they're trying to give me like a test, like a free trial. Um, oh, okay. Well, so I actually think we're going to be okay now. Um, oh. So maybe don't rush as quickly if you need to get through some important stuff. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just stop there then because obviously Richard made some good points, and I know that he was cut off. The two in the two link. Okay. So what Richard and I are talking about there, we work quite closely with. Uh, uh, the, the, the water side of thing is we need clean water to have an industry and to survive as a, as a community so both sides of what we're talking about today which is talking about clean water side i'm talking about the dirty water side so let me slow down a bit okay so what we had is um this this is guidance okay so i'm talking about the guidance that that exists we had a guidance called syria 164 which was uh it was available up in 2004 okay my clicker starts to work. Then in 2005, we had a fire at Bunsfield. I don't know if anybody knows that fire. It was an oil storage depot. It exploded. It's the largest explosion in Europe since the Second World War. Caused massive amount of damage. That created a step change because the impact of that incident meant that we had to start thinking about what happens when factories have disasters. And I hate to say it, but a lot of factories have pollution incidents every day. We then introduced a guidance which replaced Syria 164, which is Syria 736 in 2014. This was funded by all of us as taxpayers by the Environment Agency. So Syria is Construction Industry Research Association. Um, they basically set out and wrote a new guidance to industry about how to design your business so that you don't have a water pollution incident from a spill or a fire incident. This guidance is free to download, and I'm quite happy to send the links across to Simon or anybody you can download. If you Google it, you'll find the links across it. You should be reading it. So from my talk today, I really want people to be picking up that guidance because it's really important. The Environment Agency will use that guidance. So even if you're quite a small business and think, oh, I don't really need to think about this. If you did have a fire, you did call a pollution incident, uh, the EA would be throwing this guidance at you and asking you, why hadn't you complied with it or why hadn't you followed it? A lot of businesses don't know it's don't know it's there, but they also don't know that it's free of charge. So we had some changes come through since this Bunsfield incident. Um, you probably know it's there. 2014 is when I actually acted as launch speaker for that guidance. That's a long time since Bunsfield, um, but it takes a long time to get everybody together and to get the funding to actually rewrite a guidance. This is a, a 500 page guidance. Um, I want to sort of show you how the shortcuts of the bits of the guidance you need to read. There's probably only 50 pages that you really need to read if you're running a business or you're running a council, anything really to look at. Sentencing guidelines. So in 2014, the UK introduced uh, environmental sentencing guidelines. Your fines are now based on your total group turnover, not on your profit and not on the small little subsidiary that has the pollution incident. A big driver because it means now that companies, you remember I work for ADI, ADI exists of about 19 small limited companies, but their turnover is over 100 million. 
If one of those small little companies had an incident, their fine will be based on the 100 million pound turnover of the group. It's significant. EA, interesting. I don't know how many people today have ever read any of the PPGs. Really good, really useful documents. You can still download them. We use them a lot. You can no longer reference them as EA, Environment Agency Guidance Documents. That's also uh, National Resource Wales and SEPA. Um, they were made to archive them in 2015. Um, that means a lot of the guidance notes that businesses would use, consultants would use, are no longer actually current. They're out of date. So you've got to think now is they're not a document that you could just uh, use against the environment to say this is what we've done. Syria 736 is. Syria 736 is something that the Environment Agency are holding their hook on and are basically saying, follow this guidance. So it's, it's actually a really important. You've got the removal of a lot of the PPGs. Fire for prevention plans. So all regulated businesses in the UK should be aware of fire prevention plans. This was brought out as guidance in 2016 by the EA. It tells you to look at how your site would be impacted. Even if you're a small business, from a fire would you have any site that could cause a pollution incident you need to know what it is and you need to have a method of controlling it so you don't cause an impact to the environment uh, again worth reading uh, it does relate in there section 17 it tells you to go back and read syria 736 so syria 164 i'm going to fly by this because this is the old document what happened here was this applied to coma sites control of major accident hazards so these are your big sites that are going to have chemicals that are really going to be harmful to the public um, that's all that guide's really related to. It talks about bunding. You can see a picture of a bun there, you know, everybody puts a bund around a tank. Um, Penstock valves, my sort of worst enemy. I know we're called Penstock Solutions, but you don't want to use Penstocks with pollution containment valves because they're not very successful. They're flow control devices, not isolation valves uh, in the main. Um, and it was a good guidance for the construction industry. You had to buy this Syria 164. It cost you about 500 pounds. And unless you were a big major construction site, you wouldn't be buying it, you wouldn't be using it. So operators of sites wouldn't use that guidance at all. Only a coma industry would be, would be, would be looking at that guidance. You can see here, this is one of my clients. Um, this is after a pollution incident. We're inspecting the pollution containment penstock valve. That valve leaked 5,000 liters an hour of milk into a pond causing a pollution incident. That's why this is significant. People have put in equipment um, based around firewater pollution containment and it doesn't work. And that's what the, the Syria guidance sort of basically looked at. Bunsfield, major incident, nothing around the tertiary containment worked. Bunsfield, nice uh, incident, biggest explosion, as I said, since World War II. Ash cloud, so we have this massive ash cloud, you can see the picture there. This means that Cobra decides to sit this was a controlled burn. Um, there's actually a, a, a sort of a movement now away from controlled burns because controlled burns cause a lot of air, pollu air pollution and water pollution from the impact of the soot and the chemicals that are released. So the Environment Agency want you to put fires out now. So the Cobra sat and the decision was made, we're about to dump a load of ash straight on top of France, which again would cause all sorts of international issues and uh, costs, um, a major incident in fact, it's huge. So they decided to try and put it out. What they did when they tried to put it out was nobody knew where the fire water runoff would go. So we have water pollution. The site did have penstock valves in the drainage network, which was to stop the drainage water running out. They didn't work. They leaked. Uh, incidentally, the, the site was actually prosecuted £10 million because the containment valves that they installed didn't work. So this is really key to where we're going to with this is there's no point in saying you've got a plan and not actually proving that the plan actually works. You need to know, the impact could be huge. Um, the water pollution legacy from Bunsfield uh, is, is huge. Um, what you had there was abstraction points, I'm sure Richard knows all about this, were lost forever. Uh, this means you're talking tens of billions of pounds because we're short of water as it is, and we've just now completely annihilated water abstraction points, a resource that's gone forever, because nobody thought to put any investment in when we have a fire, how do we control it? And how do we make sure that when these spillages, it might only be uh, a, a thousand liters of cyanide, but what's the impact? What's it going to have on the environment? What's the cost? Under the Stensity guidelines, I'm afraid you're going to have to pay for those costs of damage that you put wrong. There's something called the environmental um, damage regulations, which is a European law. I'm sure this country will hopefully keep it because it's essential. It means basically the damage you cause, you've got to put it right. 
So Sirius 736, this is the guidance that I want really to people to sort of download and start reading. If anybody today is running a or is involved in environmental permitting, they'll probably be aware of this. What often happens is the EA or the, the officer will throw it at you and say, we need you to comply with that. And I think people don't get it. What they look at, they read it and see it's all about bunding and they're all about the control. That's not really the bit you should be reading. You should be reading the risk assessment part of it. What most environmental managers fail to do is they go, well, we've already done our risk assessments. We don't need to review it again. You do, because when we wrote that new guidance, we changed the way you should be looking at how fire water and spills are managed. Um, so what you've got is it's a universally applicable uh, guidance. It's written by people like myself. So it's there for people to be used. It's not in, in sort of really sort of complicated uh, language that means it can't be applied to. And it's free. Remember that it's free. It's, it's the idea when we sat there was to educate customers because what I want is I want a customer that asks me a question says right I've got a firewall containment issue I know I've got chemicals on site if I have a fire or I have a spillage I'm going to lose those down the drains I want a solution I want something designed what this guidance should do is allow you as the customer to know that I'm not trying to sell you something that's just I oh, was sick of valve over there and we'll put a spill kit over there and we'll put a little bit of you know over here which is uh, there great tick to box fantastic that's not good enough what you need is you need a customer to ask the right questions so the supplier is delivering the correct solution if somebody's offering you a manually operated pen stop valve the question is so who's going to operate that at 3 a.m on a riverbank uh, on a on a cold on christmas morning when your factory has a fire these are the questions that need to be asked uh, by the customers to make sure they're getting the right delivery understanding the risk i've just said you know you've really got to get into that and updated technology that whole guidance that doesn't mention the word penstock valve the reason we took it out was because Syria, uh, sorry, Bunsfield was impacted by a penstock valve. We saw the picture earlier of a, a dairy that was impacted by a penstock valve. There are thousands of incidents every year where somebody has stuck a valve in place that doesn't actually stop flow. It's just a tick box exercise because it looked okay. Uh, complete waste of time, waste of money. And what it's done is it's left the company vulnerable. Uh, reputational damage is key and the cost of pollution is really important. So here you go, picture out, uh, out of the uh, guidance. I'll just go, what I really should have there is a fire truck. Buns, so you can see the buns hopefully there. You can see the primary containment, dead easy, 110% bun, etc. What you've got to think about is all these vehicles, they work in the tertiary and they're the, they're the cause of your pollution incidents because here's your outfall. What you could just say is I'll stick a valve there, have a pollution incident, I'll block that. Okay, that's fine. How are you going to operate that valve? So it needs to be something that's uh, remote can't be running off mains power because the chances are when you have an incident you won't have mains power because that's what happens when you have a fire or when you have a spillage it needs to be quick um, what you need to know is once you block that drain does it pop up somewhere else and then follow the route these again are in the Syria guide uh, there's a case study on page 136 which covers that which is one of our case studies where um, uh, it's Shropshire company Rico printers company put a valve in the wrong place close the valve had a pollution incident and the flow just popped out of the gully pop further down straight into the river. Understanding how the design works is really key. Uh, I've just put in this here, trouble with penstock valves. We have a massive problem with them. We have to service a lot of them. They don't do the job, um, to be honest. Uh, some do, some don't. They're slow. If you've got one that requires um, somebody to manually operate it, can you honestly say that if you have a fire and you're evacuating your site, that you're gonna send somebody into the site to manually operate the valve? Not quite sure that's a good idea. Also, uh, mains powered. We are currently doing these out of interest really on the M5 motorway, which is the section through Oldbury. Uh, there's 15 of our toggle block valves going in there. They are automated solar powered valves that work off uh, the mobile phone network. So they, the idea is if you have a crash on the motorway, they need to shut these drains valves down. You might see PCD, pollution containment device, along the motorways, certainly on the M5, there's plenty of them. Um, what you normally have to do is a guy has to stop his car, walk across a field and manually operate a valve. If you've got a, a crash on the motorway, I don't know if you've noticed, it's not that easy to actually get to a point where you can wander down and then go operate the valves. So really it's a bit of a quango, been going on for probably 20 years. Uh, now they're looking at automated valves that basically from a central control room, you have an incident, tanker falls over on the motorway, they dial in a valve and they operate it remotely using the GSM network. And they know they've got about they don't have to send a human being to operate them and we're now currently doing that some of the innovation we're doing at the moment um look at these these are valves that we go to sites these are actually some uh, uh these are um pharmaceutical sites this is this is what they've put in into the site as their pollution containment valves 
they're perfectly okay. But note, the chamber isn't big enough to get a human being in there to actually go and service and maintain those valves. So those valves are not working, uh, but you can't get a human being to actually get in there to go and clean them and even check they're working or remove them because they built the chamber afterwards. Bonkers, but that's what people do. And that's what we've tried to do with the Syria guide. It's asking a question. There's a section 3.8, which I'll mention in a bit. Think about what you're designing. Think about what you're doing. It can be dead simple. That's a really simple solution, but does it work? This is a picture I would stick in there. If you look, read the Syria Guide, uh, page 162, there's a company called Abbey Metal Finishing, which is a plating company. They killed uh, 136,000, uh, sorry, 60,000 fish in the River Anchor in 2010. Uh, told me to go away when I actually offered them a solution in 2008. They had a fire in 2010 into the River Anchor. Uh, pre sensing guidelines, they were fined 162,000 pounds, I think 166,000 pounds. The actual project uh, cost, total cost was over half a million to the company. They had to move the factory. Uh, it took them two years to reopen. Uh, I've got a good friendship now with the environmental manager. He's actually the, uh, he's now managing director of the company. We helped them uh, obviously solve the problem of what happened after the incident. Um, uh, they are one of the case studies in the in the Syria guide because they've suffered the pain of having a pollution incident. All that valve is, it sits in a wall and they never ever check that the valve actually stopped. Leak. Nobody ever said, well, just why doesn't the bund ever fill up? Because the valve was leaking straight into the river anchor. Um, it's just so simple, yet it cost them half a million pounds and then two years of non-production. I don't know what, that's, what that is for a, uh, an aerospace company, but it's a significant amount of money. Um, so you just have to think about the, the simplicity of containment and the impact is great. Fail to do it and you really leave your business completely wide open. Um, here's some more the manually operated valves. Great idea, but who's going to go and manually operate a valve when your factory's on fire? You know? um, and other ones, people decide to concrete them in. We can't service them. They don't work. What are we supposed to do with them? Um, sensor guidelines, again, 2014 uh, came into is to create punishment and deterrent. So if you cause pollution, what we want to do is, what used to happen was you'd pay it with your credit card because it'd be a couple of thousand pounds. You all know Thames Water, you can see there, 20 million. Uh, these fines are increasing all the time. They're trying to remove the gain. Uh, Tesco's were fined 8 million pounds for a relatively small oil spill um, in 2017. It, it's significant. The impacts of the sensing guidelines allows the courts to really uh, punish people who've polluted. And remember directors uh, and as well as staff if they've broken the rules and not followed compliance can go to prison so now i'm going to something called spill mapping um this is something that's in the guidance so if you read the guidance i've, I've left the the reference notes there for section 433 what happened at bunsfield nobody knew what would happen when the factory had a fire and nobody knew what would happen when you operated the containment system so in the guidance we set out a standard a one in ten year storm event Firefighting material, in other words, what the fire brigade are going to chuck at your factory and the stock that you have that will potentially enter the drains, the tertiary area. Uh, great if you've got buns around your tanks, but remember, if you've got a tanker that's delivering 30 odd thousand litres or something, he's probably stood outside of the bunded area. His hose breaks and he's spraying water into the drainage network. So what we've done is we set that out in the guidance to allow you to model it. This is really key. So if you're a regulated site and the EA have turned up to you and said, Syria 736, you need to comply. This is what the environment agency want to see. They want to see that you have evidence that you know how your business would contain an incident. It's no more than that, not that kind of. So you see this running now. What, where my arrow is now is where the drainage network from this site leaves the site. This is, we've closed the valve, so we've closed the drainage network deliberately. We're modelling it now. What you see here is this is the point where it escapes the site at the bottom at the lowest point of the factory. So we've closed the drainage, great. We've got about, I think it's about 70,000 uh, litres of containment. This is the bottom here. So we actually, within the first hour of a, of a major incident set out in the guidance, we lose control uh, of the above ground flow path. Um, that's what the client wanted to see, because what they wanted to see was, have what we've designed, is it good enough? This proves to the client, actually, no, it's not. It's not good enough. We need to move to another level. We need to understand how we control it. What you're probably looking at there, though, is it's quite simple. If we build up this area here, we can control that pollution runoff. Okay? 
uh, we use these island animations to present them to the environment agency as well as the client. Because what I want the environment agency and the environment officers to see is that my client has understood the risk and is now doing something about it uh, in a sensible way. I could list hundreds of companies that have spent thousands, thousands and millions of pounds on containment systems they have no idea will work because nobody bothered to do this. So what you've got is now is this is the site. You'll see the black line. This is a wall. So this is um, a, a curbing actually. So at this point here, it's, it's a standard 100 mil standard curb. At this point here is the highest point. It's a 300 mil curb. So anybody who's obviously looking at this and thinking, oh, it's not that expensive. We're not talking about a lot of work. I think this project in total is about 30,000 um, pounds. And this is a, a plastics company. So it's not a case of I'd like to do it. It's a case of they need to do it. I'll run the model now. It's, nothing's changed. We're using everything that's set out in the guidance. So the guidance is actually giving you a baseline to work to. There's no need to go beyond that. Use the guidance because that's what has just been decided as we're at the starting point. This is now that site showing it. We have obviously the drainage, a little bit of complexity in the drainage. We've closed the drainage off. We have flooded the site. This is um, flood software. So it's micro drainage. Um, and we've made it a little bit more interesting with CAD, so it makes it a little bit more representational of a company's site. But this is not rocket science. This is something that's been developed through flood software with the environment agency. So there's lots of consultants can do it. We're not the only experts that can do this. Okay. Here's one here. Um, again, this is uh, Kellogg's and this is a canal here. You can see it here. They've been in dispute with the environment agency for over 10 years. So you think about these disputes and the time, the energy, the cost of having meetings and meetings. The problem they've got is the environment agency says, your effluent treatment plant goes straight into our canal. Sort it out. The plan was to build a 2.9 metre high wall all the way around here to protect this uh, facility. That's not good for an effluent treatment plant because you need to get in and out of it. Uh, we got involved. I did a presentation to the directors over Syria 736. So I'm just saying get get your get your consultants on board which is what we did okay here's the model this is what happens if you have a 450 breach inside that tank it literally flows straight into the canal and wanders around the site their plan was to build a huge bond wall all around that facility it was in excess of a million pounds using the guidance which is what you've got to do this is what you get this wall here is 0.7 of a meter high. So it's a small wall. And what we do is we push it into this sacrificial area here. This investment was under 200,000 pounds. It's really, really important to use the guidance to allow you to design. And, it, and most consultants should be, if a consultant isn't referring, if an environmental consultant, a permit application isn't referring to Syria 736, I would be concerned right now. I see quite a lot of uh, waste to energy. There was one built in Wales, which I was actually asked by the local community at Barry Island to get to support them with. The environmental consultant used Syria um, what, what, 164. He didn't reference 736. I just said, well, if you're not referencing the latest guidance, I would be very suspicious that your containment policy doesn't work. You've got to be switched on to the latest guidance. But using this, this is evidence, so we haven't built any, I mean, they've built it now, they've done the job now. What we ended up doing with this client, what the client, what, what um, Kellogg's did, they never built this part of it because they satisfied the environment agency within the first six hours, they could just do this part here and they would invest in a tankering company to come on site and suck the area out. They'd also work with the water company to allow a discharge of the effluent, which was through a point here. It's just understanding the model, but this is all set out in the guidance, section 433. Have a read of it, but come back to me if you need any questions. That's, I mean, you, there's not a cost to ask me a question. I will point you as much as I can in the direction of where you need to be. So here's something else, uh, section 38 of Syria 736, system reliability. What this is a small paragraph, but what it, what it does is it's saying the system you put in needs to work. So if you're going to contain, the first thing you're going to get impacted on for pollution is the drainage. That's designed to take water away. So if you want to control pollution and spills, the best way to do it is isolate the drainage. If you isolate the drainage well, you create a catchment point right back to my original Envirovalve idea with Ford Motor Company. We used to have a spillage. I used to push the water to a specific point. I'd pump the oil out and we would resend that back to Fuchs Oils for reprocessing. 
There is no pollution. There is no spillage. There is no cleanup. When you use spill kits and products like that, you purely move your spillage to somebody else to deal with. What we ended up with basically was a small cleanup of the drainage network afterwards. We virtually had no pollution, eliminated the need for products, which is what we should be doing right now. Um, you would please know I've nearly finished. So this is one of our valves. This is actually the dairy, and this is on the actual effluent side. We use this because this site has a problem with their COD measurements, so the water company were constantly finding them. What we were able to do was we're actually, I'll show it as a, and these are pneumatic valves, by the way, you'll see the speed of operation. These are solar powered as well, so you don't need mains power to run them and they're all GSM interlinked, so you actually know whether they're operated. What this site does is, I'll just turn this volume down a little bit. What this site is doing is they're holding, holding their effluent and allowing the COD to be put back under control by dilution. Um, so that's why it looks pretty gray. I don't know if anybody else spotted the slight error here is, when we close the valve in a second, um, so this is letting it through. What we do, we're metering water out. They're allowing a certain flow through. Then they're holding it and doing another sample. Classic example, watch the fact that the water doesn't actually flow away. That means downstream of that, you've got actually uh, blockages. When you've got blockages in your drainage network, that means you get sediment buildup and that means that the blockages get worse. So one of the things with any storm drains and drainage is, is good maintenance. Um, but again, section three eight, so only a small section. So if you're gonna read anything from the Syria guide, Section 3.8, system reliability, it's one paragraph, it's not much to read, but it makes the question, don't go putting in a manual pen stop valve, ask yourself, would we actually be able to operate it in the event of an emergency? Um, one of the best ones I ever saw was a site, uh, it's, actually, um, it's actually for one of the car companies, where the valve, and I'll show you one in a second, where the valve literally was a mile away, and it was a manually operated pen stop valve. And when they did the test uh, of a pollution incident, by the time the man had got there, um, the pollution had gone. So they the, say so this is all, I'm, I'm nearly wrapping up now if I can move through. Toggle block, this is what we do. This is Toyota at D side. Uh, we replaced three pen stop valves. These are big valves. These are 600 mil diameter valves. Their fire water containment plan took 45 minutes to activate at D side. They now do it in under 10 seconds from one central control room push. So you press a button, and these pneumatic valves all drop. That's all they do. They drop, bang, shut, stop the flow. That's, that's, how, that's how containment should be, is that you're actually able to control it instantly by a, a, a single push of a button, not with somebody running around trying to find a key, opening manhole covers and operating. Drains are dangerous. Stay away from them unless you know what you're doing. Um, and that's a control panel, little solar panel. I'm going to finish off with something. I don't know if we've got people, because I know this is the chamber and uh, uh, who are local authorities, etc. Operation Clean Sweep, one of our plastic companies obviously introduces this. This is something that the plastics industry, so Coca-Cola, all of them are involved with. They're trying to stop plastic getting into our environment. Uh, I just did a blog, and if you go on LinkedIn, I do a lot of blogs. You know, the, ocean, the beaches after the weekend and people just leaving their litter. You know, don't blame the companies if we as human beings uh, live like pigs, to be honest. Um, we've got to have a responsibility here. If you throw rubbish down into the street, it gets into the drainage network. If it gets into the drainage network, it gets into the stream. If it gets into the stream, the river, the ocean, we are, we are the big problem. So what we've done is a little bit of education for everybody. Gully pots, they're everywhere. Um, austerity meant that the local authorities stopped cleaning gully pots. Factories have got gully pots. They don't clean them because they look at them and they go, oh, it's just full of, you can see the sediment. So you'll see the sediment built up inside a gully pot all the time. This top bung is 90% missing because the drainage contractors, your environmental contractors, 90% of them don't really know much about drainage either. Um, and they come along and they suck these out just willy nilly. They just suck them out when they do it, when they eventually do it. And they suck that cap out. That cap is absolutely essential. Without that cap, you have a bucket. So where this works is the water level should run there. Okay, just where my, my, my run is there and it obviously flows off. This bung allows it to be a trap. So your oil, your cigarette butts, your plastic float on the top. If you take that top out and you allow these to fill up, when you get heavy rain, what it does is it raises the level slightly and all the oil that's trapped in the top, your plastic that's trapped in the top is straight through the top and straight out. You have an environmental bit of equipment that if it's not maintained, it doesn't work. I could walk every street uh, anywhere and I can find none of these are working. 
we are the cause of water pollution and plastic pollution. I get really cross because everybody's on about David Attenborough and in the oceans. We're looking at the oceans because it's really interesting. These are your these these are your causes. This this is where it's coming from. It's because our equipment hasn't been maintained. We don't actually know how it works. Very simple device. It's a trap. This is our client. This is plastic pellets. So anybody today that's got a plastics factory, this is the plastic pellets. It doesn't show it very well, but the outlet where the bung should be is here. What was happening for this site is, and fair play to them, they highlighted it and we got involved, is this plastic was going out there because every time it rains, raised, rained, it raised straight through the outlet, bang, pollution incident. Another one that I'm going to bring up, this is my last little bit now. I've, I've put it in here because it's really important. That's, that's our blue. That's in a surface water drain. There's a 6,000 litre uh, separator behind that. Add blue and biofuel do not contain within the drainage network. Our whole drainage network around the world relies on hydrocarbon separation. We introduce biofuel. Biofuel separates in drains. It pulls the carcinogenics that's in the fuel into the water supply. We're killing ourselves because nobody has done anything about that. I have challenged it in, in, in Parliament. I brought it up with my MP, who then sent me to the Environment Agency, who know who I am anyway, and they told me, nobody has done anything, anything you know that. And that's where we are, and that's been going on for 15 years. It's really serious. Think about it. If you're storing AdBlue, you're storing fuel, don't just automatically assume that it goes to a magical place in the drainage and doesn't cause pollution. This is literally a normal, a normal visit for us every day. It's quite depressing because when we go to sites, they do a pH test. Oh, it's all right. And then let that go. That goes into our rivers and our streams and into our fish and into our food supply. OK, so that's me finished. I've got a bit there with any questions, but don't worry about it. Uh, please download the little booklet to, to help. Hopefully it will help you. I hope I wasn't too long, guys. I'm done. Okay, has anybody got any questions for Richard or David? Um, we've still got a little bit of time. Do you want to... Oh, that's it. I'm, trying, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm seeing any, any, any hands or if you want to paste it on the, the chat. I say if anybody hasn't, please feel free to get, with, get, you know, get involved with any of us and, um, you know, you, you know I'll, I'll, I'll certainly... Um, Yeah, you know. same here. Yeah, anybody got any questions or want to email me? Um, got any problems at uh, at their sites? Need help with anything? Um, would love to help out. Yeah. And if you have any colleagues or you know, sort of know any other companies that might find any of this useful, we'll we'll be posting it on our website, I believe, so uh, they can come and have a look at a later date. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if, so that, that's fine. So I've just put a message in the um, group chat, just sort of asking if anyone wants us to send the slides around and a few people are saying yes. Yeah, so I will do that um, after this, if that's okay. Okay. Um, if that's done, if I can just highlight a couple of things. Um, if I can share my screen. I'm trying to, am I still hosting? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do I unhost? I've got my name. Yeah, David, you'll, you'll need to uh, make Cy the host. Oh, right, Cy okay. needs to share his screen. Hang on, hang on. Ah, uh, we're terrible, aren't we? <laughs> we don't know what we're doing. I've only done this about there 10 go. times. Like, That's there it you go. Now. Okay, Great. brilliant. Yeah, I just want to highlight our economic uh, survey that we're doing at the moment. We do this every quarter and the latest one closes on Monday. Um, this is a great chance for businesses to basically have their voices heard and feed back into sort of central government policy making and think people like the Bank of England. Um, we do it every quarter, but obviously this one's a really important one because it's the first one that's really going to gauge the impact of uh, COVID-19 on businesses. So uh, there's a link there, but you'll also be able to find it on our, on our website. Uh, and just also to highlight our next webinar, um, hopefully we'll be have less technical difficulties next time. Um, basically, it's going to cover low carbon energy generation. So there's basically grants potentially for SMEs in Herefordshire and Worcestershire to um, deploy things like uh, solar PV, biomass, heat pumps. 
So basically our next um, seminar will focus on those and it's going to be uh, Friday the 10th of July at similar time. It's not on our website yet, but we'll, we'll get it posted up in, in the next couple of days. So just like to thank you for your time and hope that you all got some benefit out of that. And thanks once again to our speakers, uh, Richard and David, and for their tolerance of uh, uh, messing about with our technical difficulties. Um, yeah, sorry, so yeah. so rushed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if that's it, then um, we'll draw the meeting to a close. If there's no other comments or questions. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for you, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks all. Bye.